Hello and welcome to Clinical Cases. Today we're going to be looking at the Foundation Block Part 4, which will involve us having a look at hypersensitivity reactions, particularly type 1, which links in quite nicely to anaphylaxis, which we looked at in the last video. We're also going to be having a look at fungal infections, which can range from superficial to subcutaneous to systemic infections. We're also going to have a look at malaria in quite a bit of detail. And then last of all, we're going to explore some of the parasitic infections that humans can become infected with. So to start with, let's have a look at hypersensitivity reactions. So these can be broadly classified into five subcategories of hypersensitivity, but today we're going to be focusing on type 1 hypersensitivity. Examples of type 1 hypersensitivity include atopy, anaphylaxis and asthma, and amongst these are amongst many other examples of type 1 reactions. So type 1 are the most common, and these are IgE-mediated. If we take a more focused look at type 1 hypersensitivity reactions, we can divide these into a first exposure, which we describe as sensitization, and then a second or subsequent exposure, which we can classify as being more serious. We're going to have a look at these in a second, but just first of all to appreciate the symptoms that occur in a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. Um, things that could occur are hives and eczema as minor symptoms, but actually as a more severe symptom, patients can experience shortness of breath, low blood pressure, um, edema, and these are more associated with things such as anaphylaxis. So stage one is sensitization, and you need to know the stages that are involved in these aspects. So sensitization is when the allergen enters the body and the antigen-presenting cells, such as dendritic cells, bind to the allergen. They then take that to the lymph node where they present it to the T helper cell, which currently is naive. The T helper cell then primes itself, it means it becomes better, it becomes more adapted, it becomes a T helper 2 cell, and it does this under the help of interleukins. B cells also then undergo antibody class switching, so antibodies uh, which are most normally produced are IgM, but actually this sensitization causes more IgE to be produced than IgM. Interleukin also stimulates acinophils to um, gather and become active, and IgE antibodies have a higher affinity for FCE receptors on the mast cells, which means IgE bind to these receptors on the mast cells. And that's pretty much it for the first sensitization. It's quite a simple process, and you may just experience some minor symptoms. But next time you're exposed to the allergen, it's going to be much more serious, because you've already got these IgE antibodies bound to mast cells. So now when the, when the allergen enters the body, the is going to bind to the mast cells and the IgE antibody. The mast cell is then going to degranulate and release all these pro-inflammatory mediators, an example of which is histamine. And histamine can then bind to H1 receptors, and when it does this, it can cause smooth muscle contraction in the bronchi, so it can cause bronchoconstriction. And it can also cause blood vessel dilatation, so vasodilation, and it can do this by releasing nitrous oxide, um, which is a potent vasodilator. Consequently as well, it increases the permeability of the blood vessel walls, meaning that fluid can leak out and cause edema by leaking into the tissues nearby. So really we can link treatment of this um, reaction to the causes and the symptoms. So if we think about a symptom of bronchi bronchoconstriction and vasodilation, we're then going to use antihistamines and adrenaline to treat these. Corticosteroids we're going to use to reduce inflammation. So basic drug classes being aware of their actions and how they may respond to the symptoms that develop. Moving on, we looked at fungal infections. So I've broken these down into superficial, subcutaneous and systemic, which I think are the most important ones. So in terms of superficial fungal infections, the first one to be aware of is ringworm. So this is a fungal infection of the skin and it usually appears with this signature red circular rash. So um, the causes of ringworm, so it's a contagious fungal infection caused by mold-like parasites that live on the outer layer of the skin, and they spread by skin-to-skin -skin contact or skin-to-an-object contact, basically any kind of contaminated source from a, another human who's infected. It, again, we say it presents with this flat, scaly area on the skin, which can be red and itchy, and it's usually circular in shape, with these snake-like patterns around the outside. Treatment, we can treat this with topical application of antifungal agents, and examples of these include micronazole and clitromazole. Moving on, we can look at candida or thrush, and this is actually a very common fungal infection, which affects three in every four women in their lifetime, 
And candida is quite special because it can cause superficial, but it can also cause invasive infections in the host. And it particularly causes invasive infections in those that are immunocompromised, and we'll look at this a little bit more later. So candidiasis is a fungal infection due to any type of candida, so yeast. And the main cause of these is candida albicans, which causes around 50 to 60% of candida infections. Um, it is normally present in the body, um, however, it's normally suppressed by our immune system. Uh, and larger proportions of the population um, is what causes the infection. So it depends on the location in terms of the symptoms because you can have oral thrush or you can have vaginal thrush, um, but you may experience itching and stinging or discharge if it's vaginal, or you could experience burning sensations and bad taste if it's oral. This can be treated with antifungal medication or cream, so fluconazole um, and clot clotrimazole um, are common treatments for these, but there is a wide range of treatment medication available. Subcutaneous fungal infections, so we can move on to sporotrichosis. So this um, is particularly seen in those who do gardening because it's actually caused um, by a thorn prick most commonly. However, it can also enter the skin, uh, enter the body via cuts, scratches and punctures in our skin. So it's not normally transmitted from person to person. What it causes is a granuloma ulcer and then it spreads up the arm through the lymphatic drainage, um, causing these lesions um, as it goes. So the original puncture site is the biggest lesion, and then it causes even more lesions as it works its way up the arm. In terms of diagnosing this, we'll take a biopsy from the wound, and we'll do blood tests, and oral medication is usually the best treatment. Mycetoma is another fungal infection, which is subcutaneous, and it's a chronic infection of the skin and subcutaneous tissue. It's initially named Majora's foot after the Majora region in India, but since then it's been renamed mycetoma infection. Um, so it's a disease that destroys the soft tissue, and what's characteristic about this disease is it produces different colours of grains uh, depending on the organism that's infecting you. Uh, not very common in the UK, um, it tends to be caused by barefoot um, walking around in places such as India. Uh, in terms of fungal infections, finally we get to look at systemic um, fungal infections, and these can be divided into four, which I think are probably the most important. Candida we've already partly covered in the superficial aspect of fungal infections, but now we're looking at how it can cause deep and disseminating disease, and it's particularly in those patients that are immunocompromised. It tends to cause esophagitis, uh, candidemia, which is essentially candida in the blood, and endocarditis are main causes um, of deep and disseminating candida. It's classed as an opportunic, uh, opportunistic pathogen, and signs of candidemia include fever, chills that are not cured by antibiotics. It's actually really tricky to diagnose, particularly if it's not candidemia, because the candida is not in the blood, so it's actually quite hard to figure out what's causing the symptoms. Histoplasmus is a disease caused um, by the fungus Histoplasma capsulatum, uh, and it results from inhaling airborne spores of this fungus. It's quite common in the US near Ohio and Mississippi River um, due to the fact that it's soil contaminated by bat and bird droppings and it makes our way to our bodies and causes us to have chest pain, chills, coughs and fevers. So again, not too common in the United Kingdom. Cryptococcus is another systemic fungal infection which is a yeast with worldwide distribution that causes major problems in HIV patients, cancer patients, and organ transplant patients. So what we're trying to say there are patients that are immunocompromised. The fungus that's involved is Cryptococcus neoformans, and it is a cause of pneumonia, pneumonia and this can cause uh, meningitis as well, because it can disseminate via the blood to our meninges and our skin. Routine lab tests aren't very helpful here, um, and therefore we have to refer to alternative ways to diagnose cryptococcus infection. Aspergillus fumigatus is the last systemic fungal infection to be aware of. It's typically found in soil and decaying organic matter. Um, it's very much an airborne disease and it can cause, um, it gets into our alveoli and can cause invasion with its hyphae and therefore it can cause us to bleed to death in the most severe cases. Um, on CT, it's got quite a distinct halo sign which can be picked up, but the best diagnosis is by using a bronchoalveolar lavage or a fine needle biopsy. Malaria, caused by a plasm plasmodium, um, is a mosquito-borne infection which affects humans um, and other animals caused by parasitic protozoans belonging to this plasmodium group. 
So symptoms of uncomplicated malaria include fevers, chills, sweats, headaches, and nausea, uh, and just a general malaise. But more in-depth symptoms, so severe malaria can cause cerebral malaria, so this could link to loss of consciousness, seizures, and comas. But it can also cause severe amnesia, low blood pressure, acute kidney failure, and hypoglycemia. We diagnose my malaria through a GM sustained thick blood smear that allows us to detect the parasite. And the stain gives the parasites a distinctive appearance which allows us to identify them. PCR is also useful uh, when we're trying to dis discriminate between different types of malaria. So malaria has geographical prevalence, which means it's prevalent in some parts of the world but not in others. Um, and different plasmodium species dominate different areas. So plasmodium in itself, can, there's lots of different types, particularly five that cause malaria in humans. Um, but plasmodium falciparum, which you can see the life cycle of here, is the most common parasite and responsible for the most malaria deaths. Treatment and prevention, looking at the same thing here, so drugs which can prevent malaria, uh, sorry, malaria from happening. Lastly, we look at parasitic infections. So these are split onto two slides here. So first of all, we look at Taz, Taxoplasma gondii. So this is a parasitic infection, um, which where the main roots of human infection is through undercooked meats, where we get tissue cysts and cat feces, where we get oocysts. So however, symptoms are only developed in 10% of those that are infected with the parasite. The disease, again, can be much more severe in immunocompromised patients. So there's a common theme here that immunocompromised patients are actually affected worse in parasitic and fungal infections. This can be diagnosed with serology and PCR for parasite DNA in, our, in the amniotic fluid. Moving on, we can look at Tania solium, which is a worldwide zoonosis, but it's not endemic in the UK. Um, it's a pork tapeworm, essentially, and the parasite is transmitted in undercooked pork and beef that we eat. Um, with this parasite most people won't know they've got it because it is asymptomatic in a lot of cases but if it does cause symptoms it can cause abdo pain um, and diarrhea particularly. Um, another parasitic infection to be aware of is cryptosporidiosis um, where most human infections are caused by C. parvum and C. hominis. Um, it's transmitted via the fecal oral route which is through contaminated water or surfaces or food. Um, the problem with the parasite is it's protected by an outer shell which means it can survive outside the body for long periods of time and also makes it quite resistant to our disinfectants. The symptoms of this uh, parasite include watery diarrhea, stomach cramps, fever, vomiting and weight loss. It's most common in children aged 1 to 5 and those who are immunocompromised again and reoccurring theme. And we can diagnose this using acid fast staining or immunofluorescence of oocysts in the stool. Uh, treatment for this is normally supported but we can give um, a drug to immunocompromised patients, but actually the, um, it doesn't work a lot of the time because it's quite difficult to cure. Lastly, we look at these two infections here, which are Giardia lamblia and Schistosoma. So Giardia lamblia is an intestinal infection which is caused, again, by a parasite. It's a flagellated parasite that colonizes and reproduces in our small intestine, and it causes giardiasis. The symptoms of this are diarrhea, abdominal cramps, flatulence, nausea, fatigue, and weight loss, particularly. Uh, we can diagnose it with a trichome staining of these trophozoites or immunofluorescence of cysts in the stool. It's spread via zoonotic transmission, though this is rare. However, the main route of transmission is via the fecal oral route again, so again, that's via contaminated water, food, or through sexual behavior. We can treat this with metronidazole or tinidazole. Schistosoma is the last parasitic infection to be aware of. So Schistosoma mansoni is a waterborne parasite of humans and it belongs to the group of blood flukes, Schistosoma. The adult lives in the blood vessels, so the mesenteric veins, which are near the intestine. It causes raised, itchy rashes, which may present due to penetration of the circare. Um, it can cause acute Kayayama fever, uh, which is after the original infection and it can cause cough, diarrhea, muscle pain, and joint pain as well. We can diagnose this in a multitude of ways through intestinal, urinary, or serological tests, and it's spread. It's a particular risk for those who travel because it's people who may have bathed, waded, or swam in untreated bodies of fresh water. However, it can have zoonotic transfer as well. This can be treated, but it can't be treated in the younger worms. It can only be treated in the older worms with prasicrantral. That's everything for this video. As always, if you have any feedback, it'll be greatly appreciated. 
um, please leave it below or give me an email. Thank you very much.